so as you heard in the invitation, this is really meant to be a thank you to friends who we've known over the years, who've been our supporters, who've shown up at our events. We have former staff people here. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful reunion. And it's also an opportunity to catch up, in a sense, to celebrate, but also to reflect on some things that are going on in the world that aren't so good. And um, which I know you all know. I doubt if I even need to say them. In fact, actually, I'm going to say some of the opposite. Um, because a lot of progress has been made in the world over the last decades. Poverty is down in many places, particularly in China, of course. Literacy has improved tremendously. Improvements in agriculture have raised income and improved nutrition in many countries around the world. And with the improved nutrition and health services, this has lowered mortality for children, mothers, and people in general. In our own work, um, which I'll just say a little bit about, we've seen really good results. So we have here staff from our programs in Brazil, Ethiopia, South Africa, Southern Africa, and the Arab world who can attest to that. And I hope afterwards either they'll say something or you'll get a chance to meet them because we have the most wonderful group of staff. And many of you have actually helped us in our work in these different places or been involved with our work in India or Bangladesh or other places through our consulting services. So when I think of what works, not just in Synergos programs, but more generally, it really comes down to this collaboration across society, different sectors, but most importantly, inclusion of people who are supposedly the beneficiaries, but in fact, who are the ones who bring the most energy to solving problems. You can't say that people are responsible for their problems and not involve them in finding the solutions. And that's been part of our approach for 30 years. And yes, this is our 30th anniversary year. Not to mention that I also just celebrated my 70th birthday. <laughs> um, so because of both the 30th year and my 70th birthday, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on my experience over the last three decades in creating collaboration to overcome poverty. So what does it take to build collaboration, and what does that mean in the world today? It's hard, first of all. One of the first things that we learned when we did some case studies of successful partnerships in Asia in 1992 was that if you can do it alone, do, because, <laughs> because it takes a long time, it takes patience, and it takes building trust, which I'll come back to in a minute. So getting people with different short-term interests, different levels of power, often different worldviews to work together is difficult even with the best of intentions. And what I see most clearly, as I just alluded to, is that trust is at the heart of collaboration. We've really come down to that as a fundamental piece of what has to happen if we're going to overcome some of the problems that we see in the world. But true collaboration is inclusive. It brings in the voices of multiple stakeholders. So it's a prerequisite. Trust is a prerequisite for people to feel safe enough, to open up enough, to begin to listen to each other. And I've just finished a paper, or I should say it's still in draft form for the 30th anniversary, which is reflecting on the sequence of how we get out of fear, shame, guilt, trauma, rage, all the things that keep us closed and small, and how we move through a process of creating a safe container which enables groups, diverse groups, to sit in the same room with each other, how that leads to a little bit of trust, and based on that, it leads to the risk to be vulnerable, and beyond that, because people get such positive feedback when they are a little vulnerable, to become more of one's authentic self. And that makes possible a sense of belonging. And once you have that sense of belonging in a group, and it's especially important, of course, in a, in a diverse group, 
uh, Robert Putnam, the political scientist, talks about bonding, bridging, bond, bonding social capital and bridging social capital. So bonding is sort of easy. It's among like groups. Bridging is bridging across divides, and that's much more complicated. Um, so I'm not going to go into the whole sequence tonight, and we're going to show a video in a minute that will just show you a little smidgen of what we've been talking about. Got my pages stuck together. So beyond that, the other thing that we've been working on since we about mm, maybe 15 years ago added a component to our work, which we call inner work. And this was really new for Synergos when we introduced it then. It probably was a little bit new in the world to, to try to put together the notion of personal development with social and economic development. And I actually learned about this through my own experience, not all of it positive, when I basically burned out. Um, after I'd been doing Synergos for about 13 years, and I moved to Montana and spent a couple of years really reflecting deeply and learning a lot about myself. And then we started doing these, what we call Montana retreats, of which I see a number of graduates here tonight. And um, that got me started thinking how if we burn out because we just, as I was, just drive ourselves all the time, what does it take to put ourselves back together, to renew ourselves, and to come back with a more open mind, a more creativity, and really a greater, a greater potential for opening our hearts as well as our minds? So I know a number of you in this room have been through the Montana retreat, which is a lot of what I based this paper on and the remarks that I'm making tonight. But when I look around the world and relate what we're doing in our inner work and in our partnerships, in our networks to build trust, I see that that's an ingredient that's essentially missing out there. If you look at the amount of fear, mistrust, judgment, and unwillingness to talk, and really not so much talk, there's a lot of willingness to talk, unwillingness to listen. Um, that really strikes us as at the root of what makes it so difficult to get to some of these deep problems. So I know I speak from a position of privilege about fear, and that fear in societies that are facing violence or other kinds of trauma is entirely appropriate. So I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about the kinds of experiences we have in our lives that cause us to become insecure and to, in a sense, hide even maybe from ourselves, but certainly hide our authentic selves from other people. Those are the kinds of things I think we can shift by doing this inner work, often in groups, that then enable us to be our most imaginative, our most creative, our most trusting, and our most collaborative selves that allow us to go out into the world and really create these partnerships. So one of the things that Synergos has done, and we've recognized that there's a style of leadership we call bridging leadership, in which a person does that inner work and is able to listen deeply and empathize with people, even who have very different approaches or very different um, opinions. So one of the things that we've been doing based on this inner work is to build a capacity of these bridging leaders so that it won't eventually be just the five or six or seven major <coughs> scalable partnerships with sustainable results that we've been working on for the last, Sarita, how many years? 14? Maybe 15. Maybe 15 years, of which we actually do have results. I mean, I should say, um, I don't really want to boast, but actually I'm going to. Um, in India, which Sarita led that partnership, it was in the state of Maharashtra, which has 100 million people. And um, the idea was to bring down the rate of severe malnutrition, which was at 40% in a state of 100 million people. That's a lot of kids. And because of these methods that I'm talking about, which in a way we learned as we were going along, 
the, after six years, the rate of stunting came down from 39 to 23% statewide. And we only discovered this two years after the program had ended because the people who were funding it stopped funding it. But it continued, and we still stay in touch with the participants, <coughs> and there is no question, they all say it. It was the trust that was built among them that enabled them to take it much more broadly than the specific initiatives they came in to do, which were really pilot programs in just a few districts, and spread it statewide because of the collaboration that was able to result from the trust that was built. So the question that I invite you to think with us about is how can we, in our own lives, in those of people around us, in our work, reduce fear and increase trust in such a way that people will be fully available to be out there with their best selves, to work together, to create the kind of sustainable solutions that we have had a few good experiences to do, which others have too. And I would love it if people would enter a dialogue and maybe say a few things about their own experience. Uh, Peggy mentioned the retreats that we do, and um, some years back we did the kind of retreat where we're doing it now for the staff. And the first time we brought the staff out, it was amazing. Um, as you sort of create the conditions for people to relax a little bit and sink into a safer space, it was so apparent that everyone was just so afraid of looking stupid and so afraid of not having the answer and so afraid of not knowing or not looking competent or, or not knowing what to do. And as we were able to take that mask off of not knowing, then we were really able to have the real conversation about what it is that we we're going to do together. It created this huge shift in the organization that created way more space for creativity and openness and working together. So similarly, I think for me, one of the things that, ha that has helped overall in any interaction that I've had is looking at the language that we use <clears throat> and turning it around. I find that um, the language that we've built over time is polarizing and maybe limiting. Words are just don't capture everything that especially when dealing with multiple different cultures languages I was lucky to move around a lot as a kid and maybe focused on that so what I now try to do is <clears throat> engage in a conversation that is more about the language that is internally driven versus externally reactive or motivated I'm not sure if that's properly constructed but having lived through 12 days of Northern California fires and really kind of um, appreciating life on a whole other level, I realized exceeding, like especially in that community, that now what draws us together is the internal experience versus whatever is on the external level. Or, and so I think that may be a way to shift the entire planet because we all lose and love and frustrate and anger. That's all the same language. It doesn't matter what color, what language, what creed, it just doesn't matter. And so if we can break through that and maybe start having conversations at that level and maybe even furthermore foment, I don't know if that's the right word, but like seated in the younger generation so they start engaging in that language, I think that could be a game changer maybe. Hi everyone, I'm Neely. Um, for me, um, I want to share about the process of overcoming fear, which you asked about in your question. And a really big piece of that for me was having the benefit of going on the Montana retreat, which was hosted by Synergos. Um, and you asked, um, what, how, how did we get over our fear, or what were the catalysts? And my experience was, um, getting in touch, getting outside of myself, and getting in touch with my broader vision or goals for the world. Um, and then realizing that my fears and behavior around fear were holding me back from fully contributing to that vision. And I cared so much about the vision that I um, found myself willing and therefore able to get over my own barriers because of my care for the world. 
And then the way that that translated back into building trust with the people um, that I work with every day was I also came to see kind of what were some of the patterns or behaviors that my fear were bringing up in me that, you know, as it turned out, were recognized and not appreciated by the people around me. Um, like a, a fear of failure that resulted in um, uh, a desire for excessive winning. <laughs> um, and uh, which also uh, expressed itself as being very controlling. And when I got in touch with that and uh, was interested in pushing past it in order to be more of a positive force in the world, I was able to have more frank conversations with, with my team that I work with every day. You know, and it was, it was hard to accept that a lot of what they were saying to me was mirroring back what I had seen in myself, but together we were able to push past it. And so now I feel that that experience increased the level of trust in our, in our group, um, and that I'm able to move forward with less fear and more trust and just a greater sense of alignment with the broader visions that, that I saw at the beginning of the process. I was also the beneficiary of a wonderful life-changing event in Montana. So I can't do better than, than she did and Hisham did. But I, I think the result of that process of overcoming fear. So let's talk about when, 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 you, when you get there. Uh, at least you, you've done a lot better. Uh, what does that enable you to do and be that you, that you couldn't be before easily? And in my own case, projecting uh, uh, not only competence, that's not the right word, a, a, a sense of consistency and a sense of authenticity in what you believe in. Very hard to do that with one hand tied behind your back in fear. Uh, and so when you have a passion to serve or accomplish a certain goal, the, the mere fact of overcoming that fear helps you engage much more effectively in a difficult task. Projecting that consistency, I was involved in a project uh, uh, for the Smithsonian over a number of years, had to demonstrate that I was committed to do that in the same way. It didn't happen instantly. And I, and I always hearken back to the persistence that you have displayed in these long-term projects and that only comes from a mind that is clear to perform at the highest level. My name is Corazon, uh, people call me Dinky. I come from the Philippines and, and what I'd like to share is uh, my immediate past was working in government as a minister for social welfare and development coming in with the Aquino administration there was a high distrust in government because of the immediate leadership that we had. And one of the things that I was going to implement was the conditional cash transfer so that we can ensure education for poor families and health. Uh, conditional cash transfer means we provide an incentive to keep children in school and to keep them healthy. But because of the high distrust of the population to government, that was the one thing we had to deal with. And the bureaucracy who was not convinced that we should be putting in money into the hands of poor people. Because they believe that the poor people will gamble it away. They will not use it wisely. They don't trust the people too. And so this is the experience where Peggy and I have been working together since 1989 and uh, bridging leadership was one of the things that we worked on together. So using that tool, the first thing that I thought was very important to build trust was to go and listen to the poor people who distrusted government. So I spent close to six months just going around the country listening to why they distrust the, the government. What was it that they were disappointed about? At the same time, I was also talking to the bureaucracy and uh, these are the middle level people of government who also distrusted the poor because that's mainly the kind of thing that they think that the poor people will not use it wisely. And I keep 
listening to them and telling them the stories that I heard from the poor people, that they can use the money well. In fact, they can save the money, part of what will be given. And that whole building trust between and among ourselves, even the own, my own bureaucracy that I had to convince that we can do this well, was really all about listening to their fears and then working on getting over the fear by getting in touch with themselves. And those sessions, I thought, really helped. And before I left, 4.4 million families were being served well by the bureaucracy, by the people, and the people themselves were involved because they were <clears throat> organized into groups and parent leaders were the ones implementing it. So it works, and it works in a massive way. But patience and a lot of listening has to happen. And I just wanted to ca capitalize on what you were saying about listening. When I, this is something I learned from you, um, Peggy would always level with anybody with whom she's speaking and listens very carefully. And you can't, she really doesn't miss anything. And that is really the basis of beginning to build the kind of trusting relationship you need. And I think what I learned from Peggy, even though she didn't speak about it, is really empathy really empathize with whom you're talking to. And I, I have become a strong believer in building trusting relationship one person at a time. Each person you meet, you never know what's gonna come up, but listen carefully and empathize. And I think that's really so important and that's so missing right now when you look around the world. And it's really heartbreaking, but I, at least those of us who are here can continue exercising. And I thank you for a great lesson you've given me. About a week and a half ago, I, um, I had the privilege to, to visit Jordan. And I visited a small village just across the board from Syria. And um, a lot of things had already changed. The trust was already built. Fear was mostly out of the community and with the community leaders. So I sort of saw a situation which was already, had already improved hugely. Um, but I sat, uh, I sat down with them and I, I said, can you tell me the story? What, what happened? Where, how did you get to where you are now? And I was visiting a health center which was being run by them. And um, they told me how incredibly difficult time they had when the refugees came across the border. There was enormous fear in these small villages with the refugees, even though some of them knew some of the people who came over because they were culturally very much connected and some of them were working in Syria and lost their jobs there because a lot of Jordanians actually worked in Syria at the time. And, and so there, there was an en enormous amount of fear. There was an enormous mistrust of all the NGOs who wanted to come out and help uh, because they really felt that they were not really there for the longer term and they, they, were, they were not going to actually deliver anything. So they really started um, uh, by having conversations and the role of the external organization, which we were the external organization very much there, was, was, was one to really step back and, and let processes happen and maybe sometimes intervene a little bit or maybe push a little bit or maybe help a little bit or ask a few questions, but really listening. Because when, when I think that trust and the fear is an important component to work on, the, the, the third one is empowerment. So making decisions on your own destiny. And, uh, uh, and as organizations, we, we, we try almost to force that ourselves in terms of sort of thinking it's empowerment, but empowerment really means that you really make your own decisions. And they were starting to make their own decisions. And, and, and one of the ways was a health center was built there, which wasn't there in that village at all, so they had no health facilities at all. And that was being, we, being set up, and then they said, oh, well, we need, we need a larger health facility. And, and it was like, yeah, but there is no, no budget. So the community leaders were there, the community leaders which were Syrians and, and Jordanians, and then uh, they decided to put whatever budget they had together 
to build it themselves. And that created an incredible amount of feeling of empowerment and being in charge of your own, own destiny. So our role, uh, I think, is a very important one too, as we do whatever work we do, is be humble in the way that you do, because we are a visitor in the place that you are. I totally agree with that, and actually humility figures in this paper that I wrote also, because of course the antithesis is what we're seeing out there in the world of people with egos out of control, and you know, that's just not a basis to her having a conversation. Kind of hoping that either Hisham or Abera might say something, our <laughs> colleagues from <laughs> Egypt and Ethiopia. On, on Most <coughs> Uh, very heavy thing controlling your, your life. And uh, I was part of this uh, personal reflection with, with Peggy and other colleagues in Montana. And during uh, the solo part, I, uh, I discovered that happiness for me is where there is no fear. So this is the, my definition of being happy. And I decided to be happy. <laughs> so for me, it was like simple like that. This is my decision. And I will do whatever I can in this life. I, I, I do work in, in the entire Arab region, trying to help uh, young people and help myself to be uh, more happy. So my answer for this is, if you want to be happy, you have to your fear. <laughs>